Good afternoon. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Phosphorus is the 15th element of the periodic table of elements. It is one of six biogenic elements needed in large quantities to make life. Phosphorus is an essential component of bone, DNA, RNA, and the energy molecule, ATP. Like the oxygen we breathe, phosphorus makes us up in the flesh. And like oxygen, without it, we perish. Unlike oxygen, however, environmental phosphorus is relatively rare. This makes phosphorus life-limiting and the most precious of all mineral resources. Whatever phosphorus is, it is not just a molecule. As an ingredient in chemical fertilizers, phosphorus makes industrial society possible, and its seemingly endless supply of cheap food. I began, I began with a reading from the book of Genesis to help us get a handle on the ontology of phosphorus now. In the social sciences and humanities, we take power seriously, but we don't know how to think about fertility. The invention of agriculture in the Neolithic eight to 10,000 years ago was, among other things, a revolution in soil phosphorus and human fertility. Early horticulturists were able to concentrate phosphorus into their bodies and communities by farming in the fertile silts of river floodplains. Pastoralists concentrated phosphorus with the help of livestock who converted indigestible grasses into milk and meat. Human populations expanded. By learning to engineer phosphorus hotspots into the landscapes, our agricultural ancestors created surpluses in the form of grain that gave life to the agrarian state with its priests, slaves, tax collectors, and childbearing women. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Fast forward to the green revolution of the 20th century. The cults of fertility have taken new form. Lithospheric rather than biospheric phosphorus is captured at an accelerated pace. The mining of phosphate rock tracks the accelerated production of nitrogen through the Haber-Bosch process. The great acceleration is on. Human population soars. In the United States, suburbia, the cult of the nuclear family and microwave dinners proliferate as supermarkets become an everyday technology of phosphorus acquisition. In the Green Revolution, Phosphorus materializes as an object of the capitalist sciences, how to find it and mine it, how to refine it, how to price it, how to ship it, mix it, spread it, market it, and let us not forget, flush it. Phosphorus in the Anthropocene gets flushed down the toilet. Phosphorus is human excrement. In this investigation, we excavate the historical ontology of phosphorus inside its technospheric apparatuses of late industrial food systems. In Act I, Gregory Cushman and Lino Cambrubi, in conversation with Scott Knowles, take us into the history and future of phosphate mining and humans' lithospheric relationship with phosphorus. In Act II, fertilizing the plantationocene, Frank Ucotter and Anna Singh give us a tour of the scalable technology of food pr production and phosphorus massification the plantation. In Act Three, eutrophication and waste, Katrina Schwartz, in dialogue with Heather Davis, discuss the environmental consequences of a leaky phosphorus apparatus, eutrophication. Just as we need to understand carbon in relation to climate change, we need to understand phosphorus in relation to global eutrophication. Through agricultural runoff and sewage discharges, Phosphorus transforms marine and freshwater ecosystems through algal blooms. Algae blooms are bad news for three reasons. They create environmental toxins, they starve water bodies of oxygen, and they radically transform ecosystem structure. The crisis of eutrophication, like the crisis of phosphate rock scarcity, is barely on our political radar. Arno, Arno Rosmarin closes Act Three in his presentation Arno shows us how we might replumb the phosphorus apparatus to capture and recycle phosphorus that is currently being flushed away. 
Arno is a leading light in phosphorus sustainability science. We are honored to have him here today as a presenter and to help us open the program. Arno Rosmarin. Uh, I don't know if this is on. Good afternoon. Um, really happy to be here. I uh, thank the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of why we think phosphorus is the technosphere topic. And why, what you're going to see today is, is going to hit it home and you really understand. You've heard of the planetary boundaries. The um, planetary boundaries came out of a, a, a scientific group. We're working on resilience um, in Stockholm at the Stockholm Resilience Center, an organization that my institute, the Stockholm Environment Institute, actually created. Um, and if you can see here, the, um, there's um, a red line here, which is like the boundary for uncertainty or, or high risk. So the one in the middle, of this, this blue one, that is sort of the, the safe level of, of space. But there are certain things that we think are, have gone actually past the, this red, red uh, level of, of alert. One is biodiversity. The other is nitrogen flow into the oceans. And the third one is phosphorus flow. <coughs> phosphorus is the w single one of all of these things that is not really renewable. It's, um, it's a finite fossil resource. And it's really the basis for all life. And um, so I, uh, keeping that picture there, we're going to flip to a fantastic guy in the 1600s. His name is Henning Brand in Hamburg that, um, like many alchemists, is searching for the secret formula to take any old metal and turn it into gold or silver. Um, but, I mean, he had great difficulty doing this. One of his experiments, though, was to take his own urine, boil it down, and actually dry it out and heat it at around um, 280 to th about 300 degrees centigrade. He finally got down to a very white kind of substance. And then it finally uh, was glowing. Uh, well, it finally just burnt. And um, he gave it the name um, Phosphoros, which is Greek for light bearing. <coughs> In fact, the name Phosphorus uh, could have easily been uh, Lucifer as well, because um, that's, the, that's the other, if you like, uh, research around phosphorescence. Um, but he actually then, at, in 1669, discovered the thermal process to extract uh, phosphorus. There's about um, one and a half grams of pea salts in every liter of your, of your urine. Uh, not, a, not a hell of a lot, but you don't need much phosphorus to create life. That's one of the messages, but it's limited. Um, so in terms of introduction, um, I thought I would just give you some ideas about why it's so important, why it's the limiting uh, nutrient, why it's the limiting factor in, in the growth of ecosystems. Um, basically, it's, uh, as Zachary was saying, it's, it's an irreplaceable ingredient for, for life. It's, in, it's the building bone or building substance for RNA, DNA, and, and ATP. And for those of you that don't know much about the physiology, your body has about 250 grams of ATP in it, of your total weight. Um, but it's turning over very, very quickly. So I, di I did a little calculation as to uh, how much ATP you are. I think you're about 100 people here. And while you're sitting here for three hours, you will all be producing one ton of ATP. Um, so the average person is, is, is turning over something, while well, just uh, sitting and not doing anything, about 40 kilograms a day. Um, so together you're you're producing that much. It's the turnover rates. That's, that's the secret of life. Why your body is 37 degrees is because of all of these chemical reactions that are occurring. We just take it for granted. I mean, I could go into um, this thing about red blood cells. It's about a quarter of, of your cells. You produce about two and a half million per second. A lot of it is ATP driven. <coughs> what is ATP then? It's a carrier of three phosphate uh, molecules. And two of them are breaking off continuously. And you're generating energy and heat from, from that process. Um, it's the secret to bone. Um, so your mother said, drink uh, milk. 
But what she did, as she said, because of the calcium content, drink milk three times a day, six times a day. Well, she didn't say the real truth. It's because of the calcium phosphate in it. And this world would be a different world if we all knew and if it was all labeled on the milk cartons, calcium phosphate. So it's unfortunate that half of the, of the, the story was never told. Um, you need about three grams of, of the oxide, P2O5. It's about a gram of P every day. So about a billion humans don't get that. They're the undernourished people. Um, and then the interesting thing, we heard about it in the other session on the trigger is uh, Sprengel and Liebig, uh, back in the 1800s, they're saying, what is the limiting factor in growth or biomass or ecosystems? And it turns out to be uh, the Liebig theory that, that brought forward that phosphorus was actually the compound that could limit growth in, in forests, lakes, in the oceans. Um, and then the interesting thing is um, Isaac Asimov, he's, he's actually a general scientist. He would, he would love to be here and, and address you. Um, he, he wrote about this in this funny science fiction thing. He couldn't get it published in a normal kind of journal. But it's, it's, it's the mystery of, of this, this compound. The fact is that it's, it's around 1% of your body. But if you, do, if, you, if you go out and measure it in the soil or in rocks, not these rocks, these are, the, these are concentrated sedimentary rocks containing 20%. But a normal, normal crust of the world, it's about 0.1%. It's about so we've got a, a really interesting problem. We have to get a lot of phosphate into us, but there isn't much out there. So the entire battle of life is around taking it up through plants, as primary producers, luxury uptake, and then consuming large amounts of, of green material. And of course, if you're lazy, you are a carnivore, so you get it even faster. Um, and as a result, because of our ways um, and living off of, of um, chemical fertilizers, we've, we've managed to be able to figure out how to, to support seven billion people, but six of which maybe are getting enough food. Um, but this story never really came out to be. I mean, I, I started sort of doing this about 15 or 20 years ago. It wasn't really until 2009 that one great indicator of, of knowledge uh, acceptance was an article by a uh, New Jersey physicist, um, um, Vacary and Scientific American. That was the first time, actually, that I ever saw that there was some sort of general acknowledgement about this, how important this compound is. Um, there is complete general ignorance. It is such that we are completely smokescreened away by carbon, by talk about fossil fuels and climate change. This one, this is the kicker. This is the one that's going to take us down much, much earlier. Um, look at it over here, climate change. We're just still in the yellow zone here. We're already into the red over here. Nitrogen isn't going to be discussed today because there's 70% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. There's lots of it, and we know how to extract it. So in fact, nitrogen is, is, is just an indication that we're doing something wrong with our agricultural system. But this one, this is the one that, that's limited, and um, that's why it's a central object of the technosphere. The industrial uses of phosphorus compounds have a notorious environmental history that beyond mining and their use in, as fertilizer, but also inspired an early form of environmentalism. In everyday use, phosphorus is probably most familiar, at least to urban types like us, as the striking surface on match heads, where it has been used since the 1830s. The London Match Girl strike of 1888 helped bring public attention to the disfiguring occupational illness known as fossy jaw, caused by repeated exposure to white phosphorus that became concentrated in bones and teeth, particularly near the mouth where it was most likely to, to get into to their bodies. 
The resulting movement, though, and here's something we can give as a positive spin, eventually produced the 1906 Bern Convention, an early international environmental agreement that prohibited the use of white phosphorus on match heads, at least for the most part, which was replaced by, must, by much less volatile red phosphorus. During the 100 years of now, phosphorus compounds have also been weaponized, first as incendiary bombs during World War I, later as nerve gas in the wake of experiments by German insecticide researchers in the late 30s and 1940. After the banning of persistent pesticides like DDT in the 1970s in many parts of the world, organophosphate pesticides, such as malathion, came into widespread use for control of mosquitoes, for agricultural pests, and even in household flea bombs, which I made the very bad mistake of using once to help protect my pets and myself. Although they break down quickly and do not bioaccumulate, organophosphate pesticides are far more immediately toxic to humans than these persistent pesticides that they replaced. Like their close relative sarin gas, they are potent neurotransmitter disruptors and have been strongly implicated in causing or initiating multiple chemical sensitivity, a debilitating environmental illness that makes sufferers sensitive to a wide range of otherwise benign substances that we encounter in our everyday life. Um, phosphate, which is actually a, a molecular form of phosphorus uh, combined with four oxygen atoms, is really going to be the focus of our comments here uh, most of this day. And I'll point out that it also has many industrial uses beyond fertilizer, um, perhaps most notoriously as a water softening agent that enhances detergent activity in hard water, but then washes into our waterways and wrecks havoc, which we'll hear about from others. Um, phosphate's uses, industrial uses, have been negatively implicated in a wide range of um, environmental systems. But, here's the but. Nevertheless, it's highly deceptive to think of as phosphorus in, as inherently diabolical by nature, or bad by nature. The very reason that phosphorus compounds are so potentially dangerous um, when misused is because the element is so necessary to life. We've already heard quite a bit about it, how um, important it is to the basic uh, biological functioning of all organisms. One thing I'll add, though, and also to introduce the theme of the Anthropocene to this, is that these, um, phosphate is so prominent in human, or in human urine and in all the other microscopic organic debris we're constantly sloughing off and that uh, gathers as dust in our homes, that uh, um, phosphorus is, um, and it's so lasting in the environment, it tends to stay where it is. It's an element, after all, phosph phosphorus is. That soil phosphate analysis has become one of the most important standard methods um, that archaeologists use for mapping ancient settlement sites. Phosphorus is a distinctive marker of our impact on the planet, going back to the beginning of settled life. Phosphate, in fact, is so indispensable that, as we've heard, its scarcity can place a fundamental limitation on organic growth within an ecosystem. John Bennett Laws and a scientist we've already heard from today, Justus von Liebig, have attained the status of demigods within the history of science, technology, and agriculture for their role in the initiation of research into the phosphorus cycle during the mid-19th century. This fertile period for techno-scientific innovation and its immediate aftermath is the main focus of the remainder of my comments. So, the argument. Widespread experimentation with, first with phosphate-rich bone, urine, excrement, and other more organic materials both for agricultural and industrial purposes at the beginning of the 19th century, inspired an ever-expanding search for phosphate-rich substances for investigation and potential use and exploitation. Large-scale exploitation of marine bird excrement, it's a nice big bag full of it right here, or guano, to use the Quechua-derived word for the substance that's part of our global vocabulary, 
um, became an important commodity of international trade between 1840 and 1880, and, and as a part of this played a pivotal role in generating transnational interest in new fertilizer, fertilizers. The widening search around the globe for sources of phosphate supply during the mid-second half of the 19th century and thereafter has been marked by a gradual transition from relatively limited supplies of recent biological origin, such as bones and guano, to much larger and far more ancient supplies of geological origin, such as coprolites and rock phosphate. My argument here, essentially, the argument of all of us, is that the creation of the phosphorus ap apparatus is as fundamental importance as anything in modern history. Not only because it has enabled spectacular increases in agricultural productivity that continue to support unprecedented numbers of people living in urban contexts around the globe, but also because this trend exemplifies a much broader transition in the fundamental ecology of industrial civilization, moving us from a reliance on potentially renewable sources of energy, building materials, and chemicals of many types to those derived from mineralogical or lithospheric sources. This has also involved the abandonment of ecological relations, fundamentally reliant on the biosphere and premised on recycling, and their replacement by those reliant on the lithosphere and premised on extractive mining, which have in turn produced ever-increasing amounts of throughput and waste. These lithospheric interventions allow us to take advantage in a um, productive way, a way that has made us wealthy as a species, of billions of years of Earth history. They are hallmarks, both in kind and scale, of the opening of a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, when industrial societies have attained unprecedented influence as geological agents, and when human activities have emerged as the dominant force of environmental change on the planet. However, the geography and geopolitics of these geologic interventions remind us that the opening of the Anthropocene was also based not only on these substances and industrial production, but on the predatory colonization of distant environments and peoples. And its benefits have mainly accrued to a quite modest number of Northerners and European-derived Southerners. Meanwhile, I'll show several photographs of this, the rotten, mined-out landscapes, filthy air and especially water, and grating social inequalities that have been unleashed by the wasteful quest of phosphorus have made abundantly clear our species' continuing lack of mastery over fundamental environmental and social problems. Now to this object, as you can see pictured here, and what I'll pass around. This bag of the genuine article, Peruvian guano, and mineralogical samples here have literally, literally encapsulate the historical processes that have brought us into this new epoch of geological time. As is so often the case, the violence of phosphate extraction is utterly erased from the consumer product it produces. If you look closely at the picture here on this uh, bag of guano that my parents bought at an organic gardening show in Tennessee for eight dollar U.S. dollars for one kilo, I gave it the best birthday present ever, at least for me. Um, shows an idyllic tropical landscape that bears no resemblance whatsoever to Peru's barren guano islands, much less to the millions of shrieking nesting birds that inhabit them. And by the way, that um, the use of guano in the 20th century in particular has done wonders in promoting the conservation of the birds that shit all this fertilizer onto these islands. Um, so it's not all negative. Even today, talking about the human involvement in this, guano is shoveled off these islands by poor migrant indigenous Peruvians who, though, tend to consider it as of quite a good job. The fruit of their labors is primarily siphoned off for use by wealthy organic gardeners on the other side of the world today, 
people like my parents um, who shop at Worms Way. Um, if this guano remains in Peru, and actually most of it does, it is increasingly liable to be used for high-value export crops grown organically, in particular quinoa. The trio of numbers on the label of this fertilizer in pretty much any bag of fertilizer you ever find, 1010 for NPK, betrays the intervention of professional scientists in the phosphorus apparatus, an almost indispensable um, intervention for what happened, who have guaranteed that this bag contains 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphoric acid, and 2% potassium salt by weight. These nutrients encased in the pellets inside, and if you'd like to take some home, you may. I'm going to pass this around. are ready to replace the nutrients extracted from your garden whenever you fail to return your own feces, urine, or bones back to the soil that gave you life. 200 years back when this story began, a good manure revealed its fertilizing value by its smell. The more putrid, the better. Take a big whiff. The most distinctive part of the odor is the smell of ammonia. It's going to wake you up. That's smelling salts, after all. The same chemical also used as a household cleaner, which is responsible for another aspect of proving guana's value as a fertilizer. It's very high nitrogen content. Breathe deep, if you dare. Open that thing up and take a big squiff. Um, that's the putrid smell of how modern capitalist agribusiness came into being. The first stage of this process, and here, this is to let you see the global extent of this that developed in the 19th and the early 20th century, where most of these places are. The place where this all began is here off the coast of Peru. In November 1802, when German scientific explorer Alexander von Humboldt happened to pass several barges full of guano bound for Peruvian farms that smelled so rank of ammonia that he began to sneeze uncontrollably. Peruvian guano uh, after the reports that he brought back and the samples that he distributed among uh, uh, scientists of honor, so I'm honoring you by, by providing you guana today, became a subject of fascination among a class of wealthy, improving farmers living across a broad swath of Europe, North America, and plantation colonies around the world. People like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, which here's a picture of Washington's reconstructed repository for dung, at, built by slaves at Mount Vernon in 1787. So guano was for the founding fathers in so many ways of modern society, intended that way. After Peru gained its independence from Spain and began opening its economy to the rest of the world, a market quickly developed for the first shipments of guano sent abroad during the early 1840s. The, industrially, the industry quickly went global, first to islands off of the southwest of Africa on this Pacific-centered map. Then to the Caribbean, and eventually to some of the remotest quarters of the Pacific Basin. Here are some of the places I'm going to focus on in, the, in, in my final comments here. So Peru, Nauru, former German colony, Banaba, the Kola Peninsula of Russia will be mentioned briefly, and some of the biggest deposits, and we'll hear more from Lino about these, are in Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria. Let's not forget either, uh, either other, close to home for me in the U.S. South, the Florida phosphate beds and Middle Tennessee. The Gibbs family, this is to show some of the social inequalities that come from this. The Gibbs family became spectacularly wealthy off the guano trade and built this splendid Victorian estate that displays the only the smallest hint of the original source of its owner's wealth in a stained glass window next to the butler's pantry in the billiard room where the members of the family would get drunk and laugh about where all this came from. So you see <laughs> oops, the gold on these northern gannets. So they actually got the birds right here, at least in terms of their genus, that they're great guano bearers. Contrast that to these kind of landscapes. Now, the proceeds from guano exports accomplished a lot of positive things. They paid for the abolition of slavery in the, 
end of the indigenous head tax in Peru. But no matter on which islands guano was produced over the next several decades, the labor of guano mining tended to fall on poor migrant workers, typically from South China. If you look close, you can see the, cool, the typical coolie hats. The Pacific Islands are black convicts from the US South, who often live for years at a time in extreme isolation next to vast mounds of, of excrement. Despite the existence of millions of nesting birds on Guano Island suggesting the contrary, many continued to put stock in Humboldt's old speculation that Peru's guano deposits were an ancient geological formation somewhere to coal. In fact, we have one here, a phosphate nodule, that they looked at their black and brown surface and thought, geologists thought that they were antediluvian dinosaur turds full of phosphate. Guano mining was actually rather easy when compared to what was done here on the coast of England. Um, accessing these uh, phosphated, phosphatized nodules required the removal of up to six meters of marl overburden, and then huge quantities of water to wash the, the nodules off before they were sent to the superphosphate factory. Although, I want to point out that overturning the soil in this way, that they actually made a point to put the marl and the topsoil back and actually dramatically enrich the productivity of these fields in Suffolk and Cambridgeshire and other locations. Um, something that uh, is not part of the history of phosphate in the other place. Here's more what we get. Here we see pictures of the systematic exploitation of Florida's vast deposits of hard rock and land pebble phosphate. This is a typical image of black laborers with a white overseer removing overburden by hand from a landscape of doomed longleaf pines, circa 1890. Following a common pattern in modern mining, modern mining, Florida companies eventually substituted heavy equipment for par labor and dramatically escalated the scale of landscape destruction. You'll see humans disappearing in these photographs gradually, and machines and the rock itself become more important. Here we see steam-powered hydraulic jets, similar to those from the California Gold Rush, liquefying phosphate-bearing sediment, most of which ended up in permanent clay choked settling pools or in these big mounds of overburden. This is an example of the kind of landscapes left behind by, phosphate, by Florida phosphate mining. And in many locales, these tailings and pools are dangerously impregnated with radioactive radon gas brought close to the surface by the industry. The history of phosphate rock extraction is also tightly associated with overseas colonialism, geopolitical rivalry, and war. Fertilizer reserves have been fought over just as keenly as the petroleum reserves of the Middle East. In uh, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand gained administrative control over a number of phosphate islands in the Western Pacific after Germany's defeat in World War I including the biggest of them all, Nauru. And here's an image of some of the destruction caused by a German raider during World War II that made sure that it went to ret return to that former uh, slight. But this hardly compares to the environmental destruction that's been already accomplished on this island to make way for wheat fields or, or to produce the phosphate that would then be used to enrich the wheat fields and sheep pastures of Australia and New Zealand get a little bit closer. As you can see, it's leaving nothing but hard wasteland, coral pinnacles. that You can't even walk across this landscape, much less make use of it. The human individual is actually difficult to locate within the immensity of these workings. And then to the end, let's point out that this is also a major part of colonialism by France and North Africa. And let's not forget the importance of this in the Soviet Union, where the conquest of the Arctic had the search for phosphate resources as part of it, also involving the collectivization of Sami reindeer herders on the Kola Peninsula, bringing it into their traditional livelihoods. And then to wrap up, we'll look at some numbers. These projects have continued to grow spectacularly, albeit you can see with some minor hiccups, during the hundred years of now. But I want to conclude with a stern warning about fixating on the present and the now. These so-called, whoops, excuse me, hockey stick curves or J curves have become a standard fixture in environmental discourse. 
And the Anthropocene Working Group, which we've heard about, is scheduled to produce a recommendation soon about whether geologists should declare the Anthropocene as an official epoch of geological history. They've become especially obsessed with this great acceleration after World War II from about 1950 up to the present for so many different things. What's going down on this boring, what's going on down here on this boring tail of this graph? curve looks the same. You find that the global emergence of the modern phosphorus apparatus actually had its first and greatest acceleration, 100 times, 10 times increases here, during the six decades leading up to 1913. And I could draw similar diagrams for nitrogen fertilizer, explosives, coal and iron production, rail and steamship transport, population of large cities. It goes on and on. By these critical measures, the Anthropocene was already well underway before we arrive in the hundred years of now. Premised on the switchover from, here we have guano, here we have rock phosphate, moving from biospherically derived resources to lithospherically derived resources. And I propose that industrial civilization's unprecedented exploitation of lithosphere since circa 1830 should become our primary marker for the onset of the Anthropocene. Thank you. Danke schön. Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for the organizing, for, for organizing and for inviting me. And I want you to look at this picture and panic, because what it means is that uh, while Morocco is only the third producer thank you, in the world, it holds, 50, it holds by large the largest reserves of phosphate in the world. 50 billion out of a total of 71 billion. This is about 75%. And if you can imagine these same figures for oil, you would be very scared. So what I want to argue in this talk is that this is not Phosphate is not a natural gift that Morocco happens to have. Uh, this took some work for Morocco. First of all, you need to discover phosphate, you need to count it, you need to compare it to other reserves, you need to be able to sell it. But also, uh, you see that Western Sahara is counted as part of Moroccan phosphate. This was not always the case. Morocco conquered the Western Sahara in 1975. So I want to tell the story of the phosphorus apparatus in Western Sahara, in particular prospecting and finding phosphorus, moving phosphorus and selling phosphorus into the international markets. And I want to do it uh, through geopolitics, by paying attention to the geopolitics of fertilizer. And I want to start with this paradox that I just mentioned, that uh, Western Sahara Phosphate is counted as part of Moroccan phosphate, but not a single country in the, Euro in the United Nations consider considers the Western Sahara as part of Morocco. So Moroccan sovereignty over the Western Sahara is not recognized legally, but it is de facto recognized by the fact that every country in the world almost buys at some point or some other phosphate from Morocco that has actually been extracted in the Western Sahara. So my story begins in the, 19, in the 1940s when uh, France had a virtual monopoly of producing um, fertilizers in Europe. Why? Because it had, um, because the producers of raw phosphates in North Africa were happened to be French colonies, most of them. So. After World War II, France was not good friends with Franco in Spain. What they did was not selling fertilizers with Franco. As you may know, Franco was a sympathizer of Hitler, so uh, he didn't have many friends. Uh, point. So Spain needed fertilizers. It couldn't get them from France. They decided to go to their colony in Western Sahara, which by the time was a Spanish colony, and look for the phosphates. Uh, they sent a bunch of geologists. They found some phosphates but they were not of very good quality, so they decided to look here in the coast, and one of the things that they produced was the first geological map of Western Sahara, published in 1952, 
After some years, they gave up on phosphates because of their bad quality. They called in a bunch of international companies to look for oil in Western Sahara. These companies also gave up. They didn't find anything, but they left behind uh, very good geophysical maps of the region and new geophysical technology for prospecting. So in 1961, the Spanish government came back to looking for phosphate in the region. And they did so with new knowledge of phosphate genesis. Now it was well known that phosphates in Northern Africa were produced uh, in the bottom of the oceans and lifted by convection during extended geological periods. Uh, so what they found out is that this red zone here is a Paleozoic coast, is a Paleozoic coast in which uh, the phosphate phosphate-bearing layers were to be found. So they did a bunch of correlations. As you can see, phosphate in Western Sahara is pretty deep down the earth. So they did correlations following phosphate through the Paleozoic coast until they found a very rich layer here. Um, 1,600 million tons of 68% average quality with some peaks of 80, which is a lot. So Spain decided that this was a very good opportunity to go into the booming international market of fertilizers. This is 1964, which is when the Green Revolution is starting and some other developments. In order to sell to the international markets, um, Spain had to alter the post-colonial fertilizers market in Europe. As I said before, during the colonial period, France had a virtual monopoly over North African phosphates. In 1956, Morocco and then other French colonies obtained independence through war and things like that. So the French started complaining that the post-colonial market was ruled by anarchy, by which, of course, they meant that they could not control it anymore, right? Morocco was uh, strong enough to negotiate prices with France. So the Western Sahara phosphates were an opportunity for France to downplay Morocco a little bit because Morocco was the larger producer in North Africa, but it was also a very good opportunity for North American companies, Florida companies, to get into the European, into what they call the European natural market. The reasoning was if we can uh, build, well, this is the phosphate found, this is the situation of Western Sahara and its so-called natural market. The reasoning of, of American companies was if we can build transformation plants in either Western Sahara, Morocco, or Spain, we will be able to compete with France in the, in the European market. Intense negotiation followed, and I'm not going to, to go into the details. I just published a paper in Technology and Culture where you can find some of it. It's interesting both scientifically and politically, but uh, this is maybe not the time. So at the end of the process, Spain and Morocco signed um, an agreement, a secret agreement, by which they would agree in not going into a, a price war. Right? So they would agree in keeping minimum prices, and this allowed Spain to start selling Western Sahara phosphate in the international markets. And this happened in 1973. In 1974, a new player came into the picture, which is the Polisario Front. So it's the Saharawi guerrilla for the liberation of, of Western Sahara. And what they did, the first thing they did once they were constituted, where was burning down the conveyor belt that was transporting for 100 kilometers phosphate from the mine into the port. So they burned 14 kilometers of that. The Spanish government realized that if the Polisario Front had the power of disrupting the flow of oil, the situation was unsustainable. So they offered the Saharawi a referendum. The moment the Moroccan uh, monarchy heard of this referendum, they decided to uh, step in because they didn't want Western Sahara phosphates to be out of control. So they launched what is called the Green March. And by late 1975, the Spanish and Moroccan governments signed a secret agreement by which basically Spain gave over the country, gave over Western Sahara to Morocco in exchange of, some of keeping some rights in fishing industries and particularly in phosphates. 
So uh, I think that was thi what this story shows is that putting phosphate rock at the center of stories about refugees, I didn't mention, but the Sahrawi people are, were expelled of the land. 100,000 of them are living in Algeria in refugee camps of Tindouf. So you put phosphate rock at the center of the story of the Sahrawi, at the center of the story of recolonization. Western Sahara is considered today the last of the African colonies, and most people don't even know. Whenever the issue is raised in the European nations, uh, something interesting uh, happens. Morocco has promised to conduct a referendum. Whenever somebody threatens to sanction Morocco for not doing that, then there are a bunch of countries, mostly France and the US, that complain uh, and stop it because obviously they want to keep getting the phosphate. We put phosphate rock in the middle of the creation of global markets, and global markets need to be manufactured. They also require lots of work. Some of this work is violent, some of this work is scientific. And we, of course, and as we are doing in this panel, we put phosphate rock at the center of food security issues and more generally um, how to feed 7 billion people. So thank you very much. <laughs>